Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Awesome, awesome. Um, I just want to say quickly, I have so much respect for people living with diabetes, and I think it was so awesome for so many people to come up and share their stories this morning. So thank you so much to everybody who did that. So I, my name is Jessica Turton, and I am an accredited practicing dietitian. And <laughs> yay for the dietitians. <laughs> And I am also a PhD candidate at the University of Sydney. And today my talk is about sharing a recent research paper we published. And this is the first project of my PhD, so it's really exciting to have it out in the open for people to read and use. And I specifically wanted to do this paper for dietitians because I believe there's a lot of dietitians out there who do want to use low carbohydrate diets, but are maybe a little bit afraid, or they don't know how to develop a low carb diet. So this paper is, is for them. All right, so I'm not including any references on my slides apart from this one, because this is the reference to our full text. And this is where you can find all the relevant literature relating to the slides today. Um, and we completed this research project at the University of Sydney. And I do want to thank my fellow researchers. So I worked on this project with Grant Brinkworth from the CSIRO and Rowena Field, who's in the audience today, Helen Parker and Kieran Rooney from the University of Sydney. This was a massive project. It took us about a year to search through all these studies and find the ones that were going to be included. So, there are multiple systematic reviews already out there comparing low carb diets with high carb diets for type 2 diabetes. And these reviews all show that low carb diets are the most effective dietary intervention for type 2 diabetes management. So we have plenty of evidence now, as we heard yesterday, to say that this is the best dietary intervention if you have type 2 diabetes and are looking to improve your glucose control, your weight and your risk of heart disease. So why do we need another systematic review, right? And my main reason is because when I was looking through all the other systematic reviews that do exist on this topic, I found that the systematic reviews tend to lump all the low carb diets together. So low carb diets from 0% total energy per day up to 45% total energy per day and compare them against high carb diets. And that's great, but we don't need to continue to prove the effect anymore. We know that low carb diets are effective and I really wanted to highlight the different design and delivery components in effective low carb diets. So in our systematic review, we are not comparing low carb versus high carb. We are not looking for the most effective diet. We've gone in knowing that low carb diets are the most effective and then trying to help practitioners and individuals out there formulate low carb diets that are based on the evidence and are going to be safe and effective for type 2 diabetes management. And if you know about my PhD, my PhD is actually in type 1 diabetes. Um, and the whole reason we did this paper as part of my PhD is because there isn't a huge amount of evidence on type 1 diabetes. So we wanted to look at the protocols in type 2 diabetes so that we can use these protocols to help us develop a clinical trial for type 1 diabetes. So as I said, the current literature on low carb for type 2, it's great. It proves that it's the most effective dietary intervention but there's very limited translational capacity into clinical practice. So all those low carb diets are getting lumped together and we're losing the details of the design and delivery components. And unless you're gonna go out there and read through every single study on low carb diets that exists, you might have a bit of difficulty in knowing how you should prescribe a low carb diet for your patients. And there are no systematic reviews that differentiate between the different types of low-carb diets. So each low-carb diet is just lumped onto this one umbrella. And you can see the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating on the bottom right-hand side of the slide. This is a resource developed for people to help them formulate high-carb diets. 
and it's in every doctor's surgery you go to, every dietitian's office, well, except for the dietitians in this room. Um, but this is based on the evidence and it helps people formulate high carb diets. But there's nothing like this helping people formulate low carb diets. So it's not that practitioners out there don't think this dietary intervention is effective. We've seen it a lot, but it's just that we have a lack of evidence-based protocols and resources helping people put this into practice effectively. So the aim of our research was to perform a content analysis on safe and effective low carb diet interventions for type two diabetes management to ultimately describe a set of core diet and delivery principles for the development of low carb diets in clinical practice. And then of course, to use in future research. So our design was a systematic review design. This eliminates cherry picking studies that support your hypothesis if you go into the um, review with a hypothesis. And it's the best way to be consistent with the promotion of evidence-based practice. So particularly for dietitians, it's all about evidence-based practice. So we're, we're following that. So with all systematic reviews, you do have to come up with quite a specific selection criteria. And if you get to read our full paper, you'll see that this is very, very specific because it's actually really hard to go out there and find all the studies you want um, to answer your research question. You have to look through a lot of studies and then see whether they fit with your specific selection criteria to move forward to the analysis stage. And one thing I do wanna highlight here is the definition of low carb diets. So if you're doing a systematic review, you can define low carb diets any way you want. We used um, the definition on the screen, but there was a lot more involved in that because in the literature, there's a lot of diets out there that don't actually call themselves low carb diets. And you have to look through the methods and find out whether or not they are low carb diets. And then there's also studies that call themselves low carb diets that are not true low carb diets. So you have to get those ones out too. Because our systematic review was a little bit different, we weren't comparing the effect of low carb versus high carb. I'll just show you sort of what we had to do for the analysis in brief. Step one was to identify those low carb interventions that were safe and effective for type two diabetes management. And then step two was to perform a content analysis on the protocols of these interventions. So we accepted they were all effective and we just wanted to zero in on the methods of the included low carb diet studies. So if you're not familiar with a content analysis, it's basically looking to see how frequent different components feature across the included diet studies. So we were looking at things like the amounts of carbs, energy, protein, and fat, the types of carbs, protein, and fat that were included, and the mode of delivery. And we basically wanted to know how frequently are very low carb diets below 50 grams per day used, and how frequently are ad libitum energy prescriptions used, and things like that, to really bring these design components to the surface. So we started with 14,000 studies just to find the 41 studies investigating low carb diets for type two diabetes. This was a lot of computer screens we had to look at. And I'll just tell you that when I started my PhD 12 months ago, I did not have to wear glasses and now I do. <laughs> and I will thank Rowena Field because she helped me with this part of the study, which is an extremely tedious process. So it took us a while, but we did get to the 41 studies investigating low carb for type two. And pretty amazingly, 40 out of 41 studies were classified with an overall positive effect and absolutely none were found to be unsafe. So this isn't the main aim of our paper, but it was a pretty cool result to show because we searched far and wide for low carb diet studies on type two, and we tried to include as much as we can. So whether it was a case study or whether it was a really well controlled randomized controlled trial, or whether it was an online program that was fully automated. We just wanted everything we possibly could find on low carb for type two. And to have pretty much all of these classified as effective is a pretty cool result. And if you're wondering about that one study, it wasn't that it wasn't effective, but we couldn't, 
we just couldn't confidently classify it as effective for type 2. And the only reason is because it was from 1963 and the only outcome they measured was weight. And we really needed them to measure glycemic control in some way if we could confidently say it was effective for type 2 diabetes. So that's the only reason it wasn't in there. So the content analysis. The most important question, I suppose, on everyone's lips is, what about the carbs? How low do I go? So keep in mind, these studies are already less than 26% total energy per day. But within that prescription, we have different ways you can formulate low carb diets. So what do the studies uh, looking at type 2 diabetes use? We categorize the studies into very low carb diets, less than 50 grams per day low carb diets less than 130 grams per day or 26% total energy intake and adaptive low carb diet studies. Now the adaptive low carb diet studies would start very low, so less than 50 grams per day, and then move the carb prescription up or down according to the progress of the participants. So you can see it's a pretty even split. Looking a little bit deeper, for the studies that were very low or low, there are a portion that would set a minimum amount, so like 20 to 50 grams per day or 50 to 130 grams per day. Essentially, they didn't include the zero carb in their limit, but there was a just as big proportion of studies that did include zero grams of carbs per day. So they didn't set a minimum amount and there was more like a range that people could eat within the prescription. And then for the adaptive studies, they would change the carbohydrate amount according to either weight. So if people were losing weight adequately, then they would, they would not need to adjust the carb amount. But if they weren't losing weight, maybe they would push it down. Um, and the same with ketones and blood glucose. So they were constantly monitoring outcomes to see what the carb prescription should be. For the total energy prescription, this was an extremely interesting one because we know in type 2 diabetes, um, particularly the standard care is to try and get people to have a calorie restriction so that they can lose weight. Um, but as you can see, 18 studies, so most of the low carb diet studies used an ad libitum prescription, meaning that participants could eat as much fat or protein as they wanted, um, as long as they stuck to the carb prescription. There were six studies that used a moderately restricted calorie intake, two studies that used a severely restricted calorie intake, and then five studies that again adapted the calorie intake according to the stage of the intervention or participant progress. So I hope that because there's 18 studies, so 58% of studies were using an ad libitum low carb diet prescription, that this gives confidence to dietitians and other practitioners out there to maybe let go of their rigid energy and calorie prescriptions and portion control and all these types of things when it comes to type two. So fat amount. Nine studies use an unrestricted fat prescription. Nine studies used a high fat prescription and two studies used a low fat prescription for their low carb diets. Now you can imagine for the low fat prescription, they were probably eating a huge amount of protein or they were severely energy restricted. So those studies weren't very long term. So whether or not that's sustainable is another question. But you can see there's a pretty even split between studies recommending unrestricted and high fat intakes. So again, giving a lot more confidence for people to let go of any rigid restrictions on fat. And the protein amount. 10 studies used an unrestricted protein prescription, 12 studies used high protein, so this was anything above 25% total energy intake, and then only four studies used a moderate protein prescription. Now all of these studies are effective, but being a clinical practice dietitian, I actually see a lot of people under eating protein. Um, because they're so worried about trying to moderate protein and then they just don't eat enough. And looking at the research, you can see that the prescriptions are actually high protein, above 25% total energy or unrestricted. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later on. We did look at the types of foods recommended as well. And I won't go into too, too much detail because 
There was a lot of detail in this um, paper and you can read the full text to get everything we found. But just in brief, the main things you mainly want to take note of here are that most studies promoted whole food sources of carbohydrate, fat and protein. And then in terms of fat type, there was a relatively even split between studies that reduced or minimized saturated fat and those that didn't worry about saturated fat at all. And then with protein, there's actually zero studies investigating a vegan or vegetarian low carb diet for type two diabetes. And with the mode of delivery, we got a lot of information here, but something I really do wanna highlight is that a lot of studies don't even report the mode of delivery. So it's not like we had 40 studies to choose from and we could assess what their delivery modes were. A lot of them just don't give much detail. And I'll tell you three studies in a minute that did give a really good amount of detail that I would recommend you go read. But one thing that I did find interesting being a dietitian is that only three studies actually promoted carb counting for their patients. And this is a question I get a lot. You know, do I have to count carbs, measure carbs, weigh my food, all that sort of stuff? And it appears that maybe the moderate to high frequency of contact that was common amongst these interventions actually eliminated the need for participants to actually be rigidly counting their carb intake. So these are the three studies that had heaps and heaps of detail on their delivery methods. I would really, really recommend you go read these studies. If you're a practitioner and you're wondering how do I implement low carb diet safe and effective, Go to the method sections of these papers and look at the supplementary material. There is so much information. And the Verda Health study we know lots about already. That was a study where they gave participants a choice between having their intervention delivered online and then their intervention delivered face to face and the CSIRO, CSIRO low carb diet study, bit of a different low carb diet, but it works for a lot of people and it's a great approach for a lot of people. And they had some interesting methods as well to help people actually adhere to the diet, which is important. Um, and Dr. Unwin actually has an online, a fully online low carb program that heaps of people can go through and requires very little practitioner interaction because there's a lot of resources available to help people implement this into their own life. So awesome studies here. What can we do with all of this information? So there's a lot of data looking at low carb for type two. And the authors of this paper and I really wanted to make this as practical as possible to really, really help push the literature on low carb diets into clinical practice. So we essentially came up with three core considerations that are important to look at when you are designing a low carb diet. So whether you're designing a low carb diet for clinical practice or you are designing a low carb diet for a research study, these three core components actually touch on all the other things we went through. So it's the prescribed carb amount, the types of foods to include, and the mode of delivery. So you'll see in a minute that the types of foods to include actually cover total energy, fat amount, protein amount, and then the types of macronutrients as well. So starting with the carb amount, there is a wide range of studies from zero grams per day up to 142 grams per day that are safe and effective for type two diabetes. Where you sit within this range is probably gonna be dependent on a lot of different factors. But we do believe that compliance is important because if you're not gonna do the diet, it's not gonna work, right? So if you're a practitioner, actually just negotiating this with your patient is all you really need to do and finding out what might work best for them at that particular time, because you can still formulate an effective low carb diet that might be up towards the upper end of the low carb diet range. Um, or you could be more adaptive in your approach and try different amounts of carb within this range. Now in my clinical practice, I do notice that a lot of people are abstainers to carbohydrate. So they find it very difficult to actually moderate portions of carbs and would prefer to just stay down the left-hand side where they can just freely eat those low carb foods like the animal-based proteins, fats, and maybe some non-starchy veggies and dairy and things like that. 
Whereas there's also a subset of patients who can moderate carbohydrates really, really well. And you know, they can have like a little rye crisp bread or a little bit of hummus or something like that and stay well within this low carb diet prescription range and really make the diet work for them. So maybe that's something to think about and discuss with your own patients. And then another strategy that emerged from our results was that some carb prescriptions were fixed. So the exact same amount of carbs every single day for the duration of the intervention, while other carb prescriptions were adaptive. So they would start very low, as I said before, and we think that this initial restrictive phase really just helped people start to see improvements quickly. So see improvements in their blood glucose, their ketones, their body weights, and that was really motivating for people to stay on the diet and then they could move it up or down from there. Um, and then maybe the fixed prescriptions are better for people that don't want to think about it. They just want to be in a routine. They're really good at sticking to the same things every single day. And maybe the results could be a little bit slower if they didn't go low enough to begin with. But if they can stick to it and adhere to it, they can still get really, really good results. So we do know that a range of low carb diets within the low carb diet prescription are effective. But the question I get a lot is, do I have to do this diet forever? If you've got type 2 diabetes and you reverse your type 2 diabetes, what happens next? And we don't actually know. We don't have any studies, as was mentioned yesterday, over two years. We do have more studies coming, which is going to be fantastic. But this is an area of research that does require further investigation for people. And there's probably a whole lot of factors like your beta cell function, how long you've been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and all these other things at play. Um, but it's important research to do. And the types of foods to include on the low carb diet. Now, there are a lot of processed low carb diet foods becoming available now. So low carb brownies, low carb lollies, all these things. And as a clinical practicing dietitian, they are, you know, they are useful. I'm not saying that they're not, um, but is there actually research looking at these types of foods? And is there a difference between just choosing whole foods um, or including these more processed low carb options? Um, and if we rewind a few slides, when we were talking about the carb amount, if you look at the types of foods on the screen, there's very little, if any, processed low carb food options. These are mainly whole food sources of carb, fat and protein. And the reason is because we don't have any studies investigating these highly processed low carb diet foods for type two diabetes. So it's not to say they're not effective. I've seen them be very useful for many people, but we need research looking at that. So it'd be great to have a study in type two diabetes or even a different clinical population looking at a similar low carb diet prescription, but one study is using whole foods only and one study is a mix. We do think there are some reasons as to why the inclusion of mostly whole foods in the low carb diet is beneficial for type two diabetes. And we're trying to go beyond the carb amount a little bit here and look at some other reasons to why choosing whole food sources of carbs, fat and protein might be uniquely beneficial for type two diabetes management outcomes. And one thing to acknowledge is that particularly for plant foods, the degree of processing actually does affect the insulin response. So it's possible that choosing highly processed, low carb foods has a different effect on your insulin levels than choosing the whole food form. And what we did notice in these studies that was that a lot of studies were promoting non-starchy vegetables. So whether it was just like an unlimited prescription or they wanted people to eat a certain amount per day. So this might be useful in just helping fill up your plate and things like that without actually having too much of an insulin response. And fat. This is probably still the most debated topic, particularly in type two diabetes. And unfortunately, there's still an even split between studies in the low carb diet literature for type two that do minimize saturated fat still. So to eight to 10% energy per day, with studies that don't worry about minimizing it at all. So what do we do? 
Well, we think that the recommendation to include whole food sources of fat or fats that have been as on the low process end as possible, so thinking about added fats but whole food fats as well, may actually sufficiently achieve balanced proportions of unsaturated and saturated fats without having to set rigid prescriptions and getting people to avoid things. And if you look at the example on the screen, this is the dietary fat breakdown in eggs. And eggs are often demonized for being super high in saturated fat. And there's often you know, prescriptions to have less than X amount of eggs per day or whatever it is. Um, but on the same sense, people often promote how good monounsaturated fat is. And you can see that eggs are mostly monounsaturated fat. 43% monounsaturated fat, 36% saturated, and 21 polyunsaturated, which is a mix of omega-3s and omega-6s. And then another example, red meat. So everyone talks about how bad red meat is. It's got so much saturated fat, it's terrible. But it's got an even amount of monounsaturated and saturated fat, and it still contains things like omega-3s as well, which are really, really important and essential for us, actually. So we believe that promoting these types of whole food sources of fat is really, really important in helping people achieve what sort of fats they need in the diet, um, their body needs for type 2 diabetes management and for other health issues as well, without having to set rigid prescriptions. And I will just make a note that there is actually no proven detrimental link between saturated fat and heart disease anyway. Um, particularly in the general population. In the type 2 diabetes population, it's a little bit more unclear. Those studies saying saturated fat are actually um, helpful when it comes to cardiovascular disease risk. And then, you, of course, you've got studies on the opposite end. But we do need primary clinical trials looking at different levels of saturated fat in the context of a low-carb diet. So keeping carbs super low, but maybe switching up the different monounsaturated fat versus saturated fat amounts, I think that would be really interesting. So that would be great data to see. And whole food sources of proteins. These are also very beneficial for type 2. And something that not a lot of people talk about, but I think we're hearing it more and more and more with the carnivore movement, is the key nutrients found in animal proteins. So as I said earlier, there were no studies looking at a vegan or vegetarian low carb diet for type two diabetes. So we don't actually have the research, but we don't know if these diets would actually be appropriate. And the reason is because there are key nutrients in animal proteins that are uniquely beneficial for type two diabetes management. I've only got two examples on the screen, but long chain omega three fats, these are found in fish predominantly, but also in egg yolks and in red meat that has been pasture raised. And we know that increased intakes of long chain omega-3 fats have been shown to improve insulin sensitivity, reduce inflammation and protect against heart disease. So I wonder if a diet that was really low in these fats would have a same safe and effective effect. I would say likely not. And vitamin B12 deficiency is actually really, really common in people with prediabetes, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And it's because vitamin B12 is extremely hard to absorb as it is. And then you add on medications and it becomes even harder for the body to absorb. And vitamin B12 is an essential nutrient. We all need it. But it's extremely imp important for our cardiovascular health and our neurological function. Vitamin B12 helps to form the myelin sheath, which coats your nerves. And something that's very common in um, type 2 diabetes is peripheral neuropathy. So pain in the hands and the feet. Alzheimer's is another one, mild cognitive impairment. But these also can be linked to a B12 deficiency. And I see B12 deficiency a lot. And I would say that a diet that didn't have enough B12, B12 in it would not be appropriate for type 2 diabetes. It wouldn't be appropriate for anyone, if we're going to be honest. So that's why including whole food animal proteins could be really, really beneficial. But if someone wants to do the research, we can probably have more clinical trials looking at plant-based or diets that exclude animal proteins for type 2 diabetes. Um, but they would need to ensure that they have a supplementation protocol as well. And if I had to summarize this whole paper in one slide, 
this would be it. There is no one single approach to developing low carb diets and a range of low carb diet interventions are safe and effective for type two diabetes management. This is really, really important because, I mean, we heard a little bit about this earlier, but people are more than just their disease. If someone's got type two diabetes, that's not the only thing going on with them. There's so many factors to consider. There's so many factors that you should speak about with your patients when you are formulating a low carb diet. And if you are doing a low carb diet and it's not quite working, there's probably so many other things that we can look at that's going on to help tweak the diet to suit you. So there's a lot of different low carb diets that are effective. Thank you so much. Thank you.